Okay, um, welcome everyone to the 75th meeting of major action from group theory and triangulate categories. Today, our speaker is Paul Barmer from University of California, Los Angeles. And he'll be talking to us about the geometry of permutation modules. Thank you. Let me start by thanking uh, Rudraib for the invitation. Um, let me apologize for uh, handling of the Zoom thing if it's not working. Can you see the um, yes, yes. The screen? Good. Yes. I'll be writing on my iPad. And, uh, um, please don't uh, hesitate interrupting if you have a question, but you need to make a noise because I'm not seeing the I'm not seeing the video of the participants. Um, I think your video is gone. My video is gone. Poster? It's okay. I mean, you see the screen. Yeah, yeah. So you, I, I guess you don't need to see my nostrils or whatever is uh, above the <laughs> camera at this point. So yeah, it is me. It is me giving the talk. Don't worry. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> this is um, um, so. I, I thank you, um, Rudradeep, for inviting me. I'm very happy to give this talk, and in particular, you know, very honored to give the first talk in the new direction uh, in group theory and and and, um, and triangulated categories. So there will be some group theory, and there will be some uh, triangulated categories. And I, I, I'm not too sure about the new directions, but I, I'll try to give you a couple of things that you maybe have not heard before. So. Um, uh, Martin and I have been uh, given um, uh, have been giving uh, talks about this topic. Um, I guess each of us gave a couple of talks, and uh, it might be a bit repetitive for some of you in the audience. At the same time, I don't want to assume that everyone has heard any of these talks, so it's you know it's a bit of a uh, I'm trying to you know uh, walk um, a fine line here between not boring you too much but yet making some sense. So. In particular, the one thing we have tried to do is, is convince you that there is some geometry involved in a, in a serious sense of geometry, not some um, fake um, <laughs> um, uh, use of the word. And um, the only you know, justification I will give to that in this talk will be this picture, right? This uh, one of the um, geometry that we are going to obtain uh, would be um, um, seen by this picture. And so, uh, instead of going in the details of how you how you build that thing and how 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 what it says and everything, I will tell you um, I will tell you uh, some of the tools that we use to prove to construct um, those pictures to and to prove that they are as as we claim they are. Okay, so that stuff is in the, in the, in a paper which is uh, in two parts. They are in the archive. One is from last uh, October. One is from this um, I would say July. If you go to our web pages, you will find a, a merged version of the two with a preamble, a few pages of preamble um, that explain also things in context if you want to uh, find some reference. And there is a third part, which is on profinite groups uh, that is still a work in progress. So you'll excuse me, uh, when we get to the part on profinite groups, uh, you know, you'll see that there is still some, uh, some stuff that is not completely round and clear. Okay, so the, as I said, this is joint work with Martin Gallagher, and uh, every word you will be a, a finite group, and later a profinite group, uh, and a K will be a field of characteristic, um, of positive characteristic, and this prime is usually dividing the order of the group. So we are in modular representation theory, and uh, the permutation modules just uh, I mean, I, you all know what this is, but it would be absurd to listen to a talk for an hour without knowing what the permutation module is. So permutation module is, it, are, the, are the cheapest representation you can think of. You take a, you take a G set and, and for us it would be finite G set, which is very important. Um, and you do, uh, you, you look at the module uh, KX. So this is a KG module. So it's, it, you take the free K module, uh, over that x as a basis, and of course g acts on it by extending li k linearly the action on, on x. So it's the cheapest representation you can think of, and I remind you that representation theory, modular representation theory, is a, is a tough business and so usually a wild um, theory. Whereas whereas these are very nice and very simple. There, there are very few of them. If you think in terms of orbits, right? The prototype would be something like that, and of course there are I mean, all sums of of, of these. And um, there are only finite in many of those. Uh, there are finite in subgroups uh, of, of, of G. <laughs> so 
you, you get the feeling that that should be actually pretty far away from the whole wild story of rock station group. Hmm? But you can still compare them. So the usual, the usual gadget we look at would be the derived category of finitely generated KG modules. So the derived category of this uh, category of finitely generated KG modules. And a, a usual friend is the stable module category, which is the quotient. Hmm? So that's the, the modules, modular projectives, as you all know. And um, here we are looking at this, maybe I, I denote by perm uh, G, K, the additive category of, of uh, permutation modules mm, sitting in KG module. You can identify and complete it if G is not a P group, so that is you will get the P permutation modules. And since this is a seminar on, on triangulated categories, we are going to pass to triangulated categories from this additive category. So we take bounded complexes. So this refers to bounded complexes. Uh, up to homotopy. And uh, as I said, you, you may, if you want, I don't want to complete it. It's, it's really not, it's not a big deal. And so, of course, um, um, permutation modules sit inside KG modules. So uh, complexes thereof map to complexes here. But here, of course, you, you ha we have inverted um, quasi-isomorphisms. Here we are just doing things up to homotopy. So very, it looks very naive. Right? And this is the gadget we care about. So maybe I, I, I'll highlight it. So I'm going to call that thing just K of G. So this is this, this piece here. And so the reason we care about it, uh, I'll come back to it when I talk about profinite groups. But for the moment, um, maybe it, it's enough to say that, well, this is a group theory and triangulated categories. <laughs> in, uh, maybe it's, it's in. Um, initial form, right? I mean, it's hard to think of something in group theory um, that comes before that, except, you know, maybe the derived category of, of, the, of K with trivial action, which was not very group theory. Okay. And so uh, what kind of geometry do we get from, from, these, uh, from, from these categories? So, so this has, that is the geometry of, of this business. The geometry of, of these two guys here, it's pretty well known. It's, it's um, done by uh, the, the cohomology, right? So um, it's the work of, of um, Benson, Carlson, Rickard, and uh, you know many um, developments after that and improvements and generalization. And so the the, the geometric object that controls that, uh, the derived category, is the homogeneous spectrum of the cohomology. And inside it, because this is a localization, this here is a localization. Um, inside it, you have an open piece. I mean, being a localization would just give us a subspace, but it's actually an open piece. You just remove a single close point, the, the unique close point in here, which is the, the irrelevant idea H right? plus all the positive cohomology. And so that would be the um, projective support right, right? And so this is very, very nice. This you can, there is the whole uh, Quillen theory about that. Um, how to relate that to elementary green groups and to projective spaces. And we have a feeling of, of how these things look like. They look a bit like that. I mean, except for these doubling points and that stuff like that. I mean, it, there are decent um, varieties of a K. And then you would expect the, um, the geometry of, um, of our K of G to be related to that. So there should be, you know, the, the, the yeah, okay, I haven't said the word spectrum yet. There should be um, a map uh, the other way around. And really, the, the, the reason why we know this is the correct um, um, theory is that this is the universal space on which you can do geometry, which is the spectrum of, of this category. And this is the spectrum of um, that category. The maps go, the map upwards always exists from the spectrum to the spectrum of the endomorphism of the unit. And then you can, the very first thing you could hope is that, well, let's look at the spectrum of the endomorphism of the unit here in, in this category K of G, right? And take all graded endomorphism of the unit. So what's the, the tensor is of course, as usual, the tensor over K, the unit is, is just K sitting in degree zero. And because it's a very nice, simple category, right? So just complexes up to homotopy. If you think of K uh, in degree zero and you shift it around, there is no map between that and the shift, except in degree zero, you have just the endomorphism of K. Okay, so that thing is very, very, very simple. That is just K in degree zero. 
And that space here is just a point. So certainly there is a map from um, here, the, the, the cohomological variety to, um, to a point, but that point is not very exciting unless uh, maybe the category itself is very boring, right? And the, the, the point is that it's absolutely not boring. There's a theorem here, maybe I, I highlight it in blue. So here is the theorem that I'm going to write just as, as, as a double pointy arrow. So that's the theorem that we proved with Martin that in fact, um, this map that appears to be just sending the naive permutation, the naive representation obtained by linearizing G sets into the wide world of, of uh, modular representation theory of, of G actually is a localization. So you, it, it is a bigger category. And uh, the derived category is just a piece, a bit like uh, the stable category is just a piece of the stable category. Okay. And so it means that on, at the level of spectra, you, you would expect a, an injection, in fact. And um, unless you are a very, very small group, uh, maybe the trivial group, uh, that thing here is not a point. So it's not going to inject at the, in the top row. And so it tells us that uh, this bottom piece here, well, certainly compares to the point, but the point itself is really absolutely um, useless uh, to understand that gadget. Okay, So that's our goal. We want to understand that gadget. What is this, this, the spectrum of um, the um, homotopy category of permutation modules. And so the first thing I um, we just mentioned is that this is an injection here. So you can say, okay, well, in particular, the, the good old story for the derived category embeds in your uh, new story. So, uh, well, is there a difference? And perhaps I think it's convenient. I'm going to use this notation. I don't think I, I introduced much notation besides um, the KG and what I'm going to write now. I, I want to call this thing v of g okay. so for the for the cohomological open so we are going to i'm going to, if i speak of the cohomological open cohomological ho hopefully it's clear why it's called cohomological it's just the spectrum of the cohomology and why it is open is not is not such an easy fact i mean you have to use some tools and that's one of the things i want to explain today and i don't think we have explained uh, very much in in other in other presentation of this okay so in particular this thing is an open and I, I'd like to explain why. And I would also would like to explain what is the difference, okay? So the first question, the first uh, goal, okay, why is that open? Why is uh, VG open in uh, the spectrum of G? Of G? And what is the difference, what is the complement? So of course, um, just from, Theoretical answer: The complement is just the complement is just the support of whatever you have localized by, right? So, so if I tell you this is here a localization, well, I am killing something, namely the acyclic, and um, the complement is of course by just by general TT geometry, it is the support of what you kill, so which are the I'm going to call that the acyclics in G. Okay, so this thing is the kernel of the localization. Just the complexes of permutation modules, which happen to be acyclic as complex of KG modules, hmm? have no homology. And so, um, in in a sense, it's it's kind of it's completely obvious, right? If you if you want to see the difference between, between permutation modules and the derived category, you have to understand why it is that the, the permutation modules are not just a piece of the derived category. Why is, why are there objects which disappear? So we have to focus a bit on on the acyclic. Um, on the acyclic complex. Okay, so is there any any question about the, the overall um, organization here? What is going on? So, uh, an, so the one important tool to analyze this complement will be uh, what we call modular fixed points, which are turn out to be just essentially Brouwer quotients, and um, an important tool to detect that things are really behaving as we expect. So the topology, the containment, stuff like that. I mean, any one of you who has some experience in this business, not, not only the TT version, but all the classical thing, the BIK type of stuff. And it's, we, we always have to, at some point, build some objects. You have to produce some objects that give you some relations and you know, some, they belong to some prime, but not to another. So the, there's always a question of how, how to build enough interesting objects. Okay? And that, I think, is also something we have not 
talk much about. So, and this would be the, the, the causal objects of the people. Okay, so these are the two things I want to discuss, modular fixed points. Modular fixed points we have mentioned before because they are the key tool in this whole story, but I'll, I'll tell you how to construct them. And, um, and then I will tell you a bit about these um, causal objects. Hmm? So what is this uh, modular fixed point uh, business? It's a, it's a, it's a, it is a very natural question you ask yourself, which is the following. If you, well, of course, there is a basic equivalent idea that you, you should think of, of orbits as G points, right? Uh, because you cannot split an orbit into pieces uh, G equivalently. And uh, you could also think that the morphism, whatever, whatever notation here, the G equivalent morphism from G mod H into whatever gadget is just, well, you, you send, the, the, <laughs> you send the, the class of one somewhere, and then you have to make sure that this is H fixed. Okay? So, so H fixed points play an important role in, in everything we do, G equivalently, simply because we're, it's about looking at points. Hmm? And so if you do that, if you start with the G set, maybe G sets for as a category, and you take the H fixed points, what you get, well, there is, you, you get a set, but you get a bit more than a set. You still have an action of the normalizer of H. So the normalizer of H and H acts trivially by construction. So you have an action of the vial group. And my notation for the vial group will be this, okay? Hopefully it's not too wild, it doesn't collide with stack notation or whatnot. I mean, just a very simple notation. If H is normal, it's just G mod H. And if H is not normal, it says, okay, you have to chop off something from G and then mod, mod out H. Huh? Because I think this notation is not too bad. So this is my notation for um, the vine group and you get such a thing. And then when you linearize as, as we have uh, started with, so you get here uh, permutation modules. And then you linearize here and you get permutation modules over the vine group. Well, um, the question is, what can we put here, which makes that commute? Hmm? And the naive fixed point won't, won't do the job because uh, you, you, you know, take G itself, uh, it would typically have no fixed points. So you would get an empty set um, here and you would get zero here, but um, there are very often, uh, there are always um, fixed points. You just add, you know, you add an orbit. You had, for instance, the G fixed points in KG, you would have, the sum of all the elements of, of all the basis element would be G invariant. Okay, so this does not commute with naive fixed points. And what we would like is we'd like a factor here, maybe we call it psi H, such that it makes that commute. And of course, um, you know, um, the, um, the, the game is about uh, tensor. And so what we, uh, tensor and triangulated. So of course we want a tensor and additive functor, which does that. We want a tensor additive functor so maybe just say the word tensor functor of um, psi h from perm g. Um, uh, let me drop the k right when it's obvious. Um, and and you want it to linearize. So if you do it on something like a, a G set, it should be take the the h fixed points inside and and get that. And well, the, the, the good news, if you want a short story, is that this is impossible. You cannot, you cannot do it. Uh, not possible in general. And the, the, for the following reason is that if you take, if you let uh, P be the pillow, the, the pillow subgroup, <laughs> the silo subgroup of, of uh, the P silo subgroup of, of G, uh, then it is an easy exercise that to see that the, the unit K uh, is a direct summand of K of G mod P, which is a, a permutation module, hmm? it's just because the index is, is invertible in K. And if you apply psi uh, H to uh, the unit, well, you expect to get the unit, but you will get K of uh, the fixed points if, you, if everything works as, as we want. And therefore, it tells us that um, the, this, the H fixed points of G mod P should be non-empty, otherwise you would get zero at the here. Mm -hmm. So this is non-zero, so this is non-empty. And that tells you, it's an easy exercise, that uh, H is subconjugate to P. Mm -hmm. So H is subconjugate to P. In particular, H is a P group. 
And so if, if unless H is a P group, you don't have this gadget. Of course, you always have it for H equal one, for instance, that would be the identity factor. Thank you very much. One is a P group, 20P. <laughs> and so uh, that's, that's the first obstruction and it's the only obstruction. That's the only obstruction. So um, if H is a P group, then it works. And it's the power quotients. But instead of, so the, for those of you who know how to build power quotients, you try to look into literature for the definition. It is usually done in the category of KG modules. You mod out something, you, have, you take a module and you mod out everything, which is, you know, the traces of stuff induced from proper subgroups. And then you get another module and then you say, well, then look, the value group acts on that. And then you say, oh, look, if that the module we started from was permutation, then this, this module we created actually happens to be also permutation. And you make arranged the story like that. It's a bit odd because we are kind of exactly trying to avoid mixing up, confusing the, um, you know, this world and this world. So it, it would be much nicer to try to get a construction which stays entirely in this world. And it is possible, and that's, let me quickly tell you how it works. So, uh, well, um, we can reduce to the case um, that H is normal in G because uh, the, 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 otherwise in general, the, you know, the, the, the thing in G you will just take the thing in the normalizer and then uh, and first you just restrict from g to the normalizer okay that's the usual pattern so you first restrict to the normalizer and then you do a construction in the, in the normal case and you define the general story like that, okay so what happens in the normal case in the normal case so if h is normal and you look at the category the permutation category of g well um it is an additive category generated by the g mod case and there are two types of Ks, those that contain H and those that don't. Those that contain H come from um, the Val group, which is here just a quotient, by inflation. And inflation is a free faithful functor, which is a tensor functor, so that's, that's very nice. And then you say, okay, well, I would like to chop off everything from perm G that is, you know, in, in the style, here this, what I'm writing here is an additive quotient, so in the style of uh, when you construct a stable category, where you take modules and you mod out some modules that you don't like, the projectives, the injectives. Uh, well, we, we can do something like that. We take the subcategory generated by all the things which are, um, I don't know, what's the word, uh, H projective or something, no, so whatever. Um, uh, so let me say explicitly what I mean, the, the, the H mod K, which do not, uh, which are not inflated from, from K, so that is K does not contain H. So you mod that out. And you know that's an additive quotient. So in particular, it is full. It's a tensor functor because that thing here is a, is a tensor ideal. That's just the Mackey formula. And so you, you get a full tensor functor that goes this way. This one is just an additive quotient. Sorry. Let me try to get my pen straight. So the additive quotient, also a tensor functor. And then the nice fact is that the composites here is an equivalent, that's a little proposition. And that's an orthogonality property. So you see, because it's both are full um, and they are essentially subjective by construction. Um, they are essentially subjective by construction because um, you know, in perm G, there are two types of objects as generators, those that come from here and those that we kill. So, um, in this quotient, you get everything from here. So essential subjectivity, fullness is easy and the, the faithfulness is a usual trick about, um, you know, morphism between permutation module, you have to play with that. And at some point you have some index that comes up and because H is a P group, these indices that appear are divisible by P and some maps vanish because of that, okay? So the key point is that the, if you have two uh, inflated modules from here and the map that factors by one, one of those gadgets, that map has to be zero. And you play around with your, with your adjunction and, and you get the result, okay? So that's an equivalence. And, you know, that should be reminiscent of the way in algebraic geometry, in, excuse me, in equivalent homotopy theory, you, you, you construct the, the, in the geometric fixed points. You say, okay, well, I have my, my G spectra. I mod out in a triangular way. That is, um, um, do a Verdi quotient, everything which is uh, induced from uh, proper subgroups. And then when I inflate from the trivial groups, so come with trivial action, and I go down in this quotient, I get an equivalent. Uh, and so you can define, if you want, the 
the, the fixed points by saying, okay, I do, I go down here and then I undo the equivalence. Okay, that's the definition of psi h. Okay. And you see that uh, it is conceptually a bit cleaner than, than using modules, chopping out the modules in the ambient abelian category and then remembering that it li lives in the permutation category. Everything is happening at the level of permutation categories. And there is no chopping off modules themselves. We are chopping off categories, right? So we are, we, we are uh, it, it's uh, happening at one level up in, in a sense, but gives the same answer, which is quite amusing. And, and uh, maybe I should make public uh, uh, amends on that because because the construction was so different, I was I was I have been pushing back on people who who told me, oh, isn't that just our quotients? I was making comments like, yeah, it can't because we are doing it at the level of the category and not at the level of the module. But you know, sometimes math is uh, full of surprises. So <laughs> uh, let's take an example. Uh, then, of course, I, I'm sorry. I should just really clarify that. Then we then get it. We define psi h on the homotopy categories just by uh, taking it uh, level wise, okay? Every uh, P subgroup. So maybe it's a good opportunity to, to introduce this shortcut. That means a P subgroup of, of G. Let me give you an example. Uh, take the object, uh, take G equals C2 and the prime P equals 2, uh, and take X to be the uh, interesting uh, acyclic complex of permutation modules, hmm, with the usual uh, uh, augmentation augmentation maps. And so this is an object in the category of, of permutation module. It is acyclic. And if you take the, the, the C2 fixed points of that gadget, you do it in each degree. The C2 fixed points of one is one. The C2 fixed points of KC2, you just have to take the fixed points of C2, you get zero, empty, so zero, and then you get K. And that's very not acyclic. And in particular, it says that uh, psi H in general does not pass to the derived category. Does not localize to the derived category. Hmm? So it says that um, this is really a construction that makes sense at the level of those homotopy category of permutation modules, but they, it does not make sense <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> at the level of um, derived categories. Okay, so now, uh, good news. We have um, TT functors out of um, KG, plenty of them for every subgroup. Uh, just point out that for H equal one, this is the identity. So of course, this family of TT functor tells you everything about KG in a rather dull way, because among them you have the identity, but we are going to be a bit um, finer about that. So, but maybe uh, emphasize that we have a, a map. So maybe I'll, <laughs> in tech, it's, it's easy to distinguish a, a upper uppercase psi from a lowercase psi. I'm not sure I can do uh, that on the screen. So this is the, the, the map on spectra induced by uh, functor. Mm -hmm. So it goes backwards, it goes from the spectrum of K of the Val group back to the spectrum about. Okay, so this is um, a continuous map at the level of spectra. And we can combine that with the inclusion that we had uh, before. So I just told you it was an inclusion, but, uh, I, as I said, um, it's an open inclusion, thanks to uh, playing with um, those causal objects. So <clears throat> you can also say, well, even for the Val group, I have the same picture I started from. I have an open, which is the cohomological open, right? And now that's interesting even for H equal one. For H equal one, it gives us the cohomological open we started from, but for every uh, P subgroup, there is a cohomological open in the Val group that's it, that will uh, come into um, spec KG. And um, one of the important results is that this is also an injection. Okay, so that's also a theorem. I'm sorry for stating my terms in, in the form of decoration of arrows, localization or injection, but that's, that's an important point. So this map is injective. And again, that's one of those things we get by you know, um, playing with objects and stuff like that. But I guess in that case, yeah, yeah, I, we, we, we need that. So um, we also know this actually here is a closed map. It's not injective in general, 
but it's a closed map. And um, so um, you can really think of those. These these will give you in in here uh, open. I mean, relatively open pieces. So they are they are open in their closure, right? So they, they give you like strata on this on this um, uh, spec of kg. <laughs> So you have one basic open which comes from the derived category, and then you have strata in the, in the spectrum of, of in the support of the ACK. So the the one way one way of stating the, the one answer to the question we started from the support of the acyclic, so the complement between um, what comes from the derived category and what we are studying is actually um, a, a union for the P subgroups. Different from one, the one for, for one is the, the is what we know a complement of that, and um, of the images of those map. Um, um, well, you can actually just use the map psi h themselves, because these these um, these maps here, these maps here, even before restricting to the cohomological open, uh, these maps they all land in. In that in that bit here, they never except for h equal one, they never touch the, the cohomological open. So um, maybe it's an it, it's an incarnation of this fact that the modular fixed points don't exist on the derived category. They don't even touch they don't even touch the the, the, the spectrum of the derived category at the, at the spectrum level, except for h equal one, of course, where it's just the identity. Okay, uh, another way of, of rephrasing that, maybe that's the theorem of all the points. We know all the points in the spectrum by saying, uh, um, and that thing is the disjoint union over the, the piece of groups up to conjugation. So the only way that uh, two things um, overlap is if, they are, if the subgroups you're playing with are, are G conjugate of uh, these pieces. And that's using the fact that this is injected. Okay? So as a set, it is classified like that. And, and in other words, you can, any prime, any point in the spectrum of Kg is of the form, is a, our notation for that is uh, uh, HP. Uh, so it is uh, the image by Psi H of a little p and this p, is a point in the cohomological open for G mod H. So in other words, that's a, a piece, uh, um, a point in the uh, homology spectrum of the cohomology of G mod H. So if you really like your cohomology, then you're happy because all the points come um, from uh, cohomology business, but not just at the level of, of G itself, but you have to, play with all the, the subquotients. That's kind of one of the take homes of this uh, story is that we can't just handle a G and its subgroups. We also have to uh, look at subquotients. And it makes it, you know, a group theory is a bit uh, tricky in, in that respect. You have groups that, whose com so the cohomology, the size of cohomology by Quillen is, is, you know, related to the P rank of the group. So the, the cool dimension is the P rank. And so uh, for the homology spectrum. And so, um, if you want to know, you know how big are those pieces, you have to look at the P rank and uh, you see that you, you have groups maybe like you know, quaternion eight, um, which have P rank one. So they have a very small cohomological open that if you mod out by the center, you get a Klein four, which has P rank two. And so there you get a whole, a whole P one, if you want a whole two dimension P one with a close point on top. So it's a two dimensional um, complement. So if, if you, even with very small groups like quaternion eight, you see that the, the difference between the, the cohomological open from the derived category and this, this support of acyclic can be very big. This might be actually, could be much bigger uh, than VG. Simply because uh, the sectional P rank, the P rank of the sub quotients can be actually bigger than the, the P rank of G itself. Just Q8 being the first easy example. Okay, so uh, that's the um, 
essentially the story you might have heard before, except maybe I explained a bit how you, did, you build this, these um, modular fixed points. And as I said, many of the uh, claims, for instance, the, uh, the, the, the fact that this is an open, uh, the inject, some of these injectivities, some of the, um, the surjectivity relies on something different, which is the uh, detection of nil potents. So the, these modular fixed points together, they detect nil potents of maps on K of G. Uh, and on the big categories, you have a version on the big categories. I won't go into the big categories today, but on the big categories associated to these things, the, the incompletion, if you like to talk that way, um, then um, you also have those modular fixed points and they detect, they, they, they are collectively conservative. So if a big object is zero uh, under all modular fixed points, then it is zero in the category itself. So that tells us that the map on spectra will be subjective. So that's the subjectivity of this. Of this in this term, everything comes that way. But for the injectivity and for the topological relations and stuff like that, it's important to have enough objects. So let's discuss that. Let's discuss the, the causal object. A good place to, to ask for questions if there are any. By the way, Rudradip, uh, how much time do I have? I mean, should I, what time should I stop? You can speak for an hour. You can speak for however long you want. <laughs> okay, so until nine, maybe it should be, I should stop before nine or something. Okay, yeah, so, so yeah, let me say something about causal objects. So the definition is, is very, uh, I mean, maybe you will disagree with the name causal object, but you'll see why we put it this way. So um, the causal object for um, subgroup, maybe I call it K because I'm going to take H fixed points of that gadget. So K is a subgroup of, of G. Well, it's the tensor induction from K to G of the most silly complex you can think of, I mean, short of zero maybe, uh, is this complex here. Mm -hmm. So here I put K with trivial action, I take the identity from K to K, maybe if to fix the ideas that put that guy in degree zero. And this is homotopically trivial. That gadget is acyclic, homotopically trivial, but um, it is not when you tensor induce, tensor induction does not preserve homotopy equivalence, does not preserve um, quasi, uh, the, 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 the tensor induced would still be acyclic, but it, it will not be homotopically trivial. So just be a bit careful about that. It is still acyclic. So this, this gadget is in the acyclics of G. It goes to zero in the derived category, simply because uh, in the derived category, when you want to test if something is zero, you can even restrict down to this trivial subgroup. And if you're doing the trivial subgroup, you have just tensored together G mod K copies of, of this silly complex, and that's certainly um, an acyclic. So let me give you an example. So, so uh, tensor induction is essentially you tensor this, this thing with itself, uh, the number of times you need here, uh, the index of uh, K and G. And then you let G act on that by essentially uh, permuting the factor, the way G acts on G mod K. Mm -hmm. It's a bit more subtle in general. You have to remember how, you know, you have to pick some representative and remember the difference between the action here and, and, and what, it, what you see on the representative. And this difference is uh, measured by K and then you let K act inside um, by this difference of the two actions. But this, um, this is irrelevant here because K acts trivially. I mean, big K acts trivially on this uh, complex here. Sorry for calling everything K. I should have called the field little g maybe. So um, there we go. Okay. So uh, for for example, and, and th there are signs coming in potentially at least in characteristic mode two. Uh, there are signs coming in which comes from the swap of factors in a in a tensor product of complexes. Okay. But let's take an example um, in characteristic two for simplicity. So G is C2 and, and K is one. And so what is this causal object uh, for C2 one? Well, it is just the, the, the gadget I told you about before. If you tensor, if you tensor um, as a K vector space, you would get K, K2, K, like in a causal construction, right? <clears throat> but because the action, the action on this middle guy is via C2, you, it's easy to check. That's actually the free uh, gadget here and that you get the complex we, we care about. Mm -hmm. So that's an example of, a, of an uh, interesting acyclic that comes from this tensor induction. And in fact, it will be this, this guy is actually in that case, it is a generator of the acyclic for C2. I should mention that uh, Duggar, um, uh, Hazel, and May have described all objects in here. For, for In the case of, of C2, there's a uh, 
maybe it's a tame setting. We don't have a finite number of indecomposable, but you have a complete classification of the indecomposable. You have lists, and um, and for p um, odd, that, uh, that category is wide. Okay, that's uh, uh, excuse me. Yeah, that's also true with the acyclic. I mean, I, I'm talking about these ones. Yeah. So even for uh, for the cyclic groups, these are wild unless p equals two, where it's wild but not too wild. It's <laughs> reasonable. So you have an, it, it, excuse me, it's not wild. It, it's not finite representation type. It's, you have an infinite number of isomorphism of indecomposable, but you can list them. And this is one of the basic ones. This uh, generator of the acyclic. <clears throat> In fact, the spectrum in the case of, of CP uh, has three points like that, with specialization like that, it's very, very basic. And if you look at the, the, the stuff you can see with the permutation module, that closed point will be the support of KC2. Um, the support of KC, of K itself would be that. So for C2, the, 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 there aren't so many permutation modules for, for CP in general, right? You have only KCP and K. And that's what you see, and you need to be able to see, by see, I mean, uh, you know, build an object that detects, you need to be able to see that point here. Hmm? And how do you see that point? Well, via this object. This object has support. That's the support of this thing. And so that's a general pattern that happens is that um, um, the permutation modules themselves, they are not, um, they are only detecting, make a statement, um, Remark. If you look at the support of something like K uh, G mod H, we can tell that we know ex exactly what this is. And so it's like in the usual in the usual story, it's exactly the image of the map on spectra induced by restriction from G to H. So uh, maybe I, I have a short notation for that, which is rho H. Um, so it's just the, the part of the spectrum that comes from the restriction. And um, uh, it's 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 too coarse hmm? in the um, in um, yeah maybe I'm, I'm digressing here but um, uh, okay let me cut the discussion here uh, I could make comments on that if you want uh, ask questions a bit later okay so um, let me see how much I want to say because I would like also to say a few words about the profinite story um, okay so. The, these causal objects, they are very useful to, to, to make those topological distinctions. The, the, key, the key lemma is that um, we, we, we can tell how they behave under the, the modular fixed points. So the modular fixed points for this gadget will give you, well, either a generator of the whole category, so that's something which has support everything, uh, if, K, if H is not uh, subconjugate to, uh, to K. And if H is subconjugate to K, then you get an acyclic. And if H is conjugate to K, then you get not only an acyclic, but you get actually a generator of the acyclic. So these things are, are much finer and they are related to what we care about, this, this, um, this um, this complement of the cohomological open. Okay, so that's really one of the key lemmas that that make the co the causal object uh, um, useful, and it's really um, you know a computation. We 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 we, we, we can describe those complexes in low degrees. You know, in degree zero it's k, in degree one it's always k of g mod, g mod k, and essentially just from these these facts and uh, what happens on modular fixed points on permutation modules, uh, we can tell uh, what what this gives. Okay. So that's a computational uh, trick. And so, uh, for instance, if you want to know what is the image of these modular fixed points, let's say that H is normal. Uh, we, we have the answer in general, but it's a bit more tricky. Uh, then the image for the, the map induced by modular fixed points, uh, for that you would need, um, it's a bunch, it's an intersection of support of causal objects. And the case you have to take are the ones which do not uh, contain H. So H is not subconjugate to K, but I'm, I'm assuming uh, H normal. So, and in particular, that's a closed piece. That's an important uh, part of it because this finite intersection of support uh, is a closed piece. Okay. Um, so yes, the special case, the support of the acyclic, the, the one we care about, 
how do we know that it is closed, not just a Thomason subset? Well, it's just the causal of, of one. So the tensor induction from one to all the way to G of, um, of the trivial complex. Okay, so hopefully I gave you some uh, feeling of, of uh, how we, you know, uh, it, it's very far from drawing those pictures what I've done today. But um, <clears throat> as I said, if you listen to other talks, probably you have, you have seen something more connected to that, but with less details on how you, you obtain the pieces. And today's a bit different. I, I, I told you more details about the tools to, to, to get those pieces, but less how you, how you get them and attach them and all that. Okay, so uh, it's all in the all in the preprint. It's only seventy five pages, so <laughs> just <laughs> be courageous. Okay, so um, <clears throat> let me uh, say a few words about the profinite situation, and it's really one of uh, what was our motivation. So, of course, you might say, well, why do we care about this category of uh, kg? And well, of course, it's permutation modules, it's triangulated categories, all nice and, and, and sweet. Uh, you can have interpretation in, in homotopy theory in terms of, of you know, modules of the constant Mackey functor and stuff like that, all nice and sweet. You can have an inter interpretation in terms of cohomological Mackey functors, and that's also all nice and sweet. But it's, um, you know, it's kind of all in, in the world of uh, representation theory in a sense. <clears throat> And for us, the motivation was that it connects with Artin motives. Um, K of G relates to Artin motives. And I'm not going to, you know, my experience as a, as a, as a participant, as a listener, as someone in, a, in the audience of a talk, if I give a motivation uh, which is of the form, oh, this thing connects to something else that you don't know, uh, it's not very useful as a motivation, but, but, but just bear with me. Uh, if you don't know what Artin motives are, hopefully you have heard of motives and you can see that, you know, it should be an interesting uh, direction of, of tensor triangular geometry to try to, to, to know more about the spectrum of, of those categories. And there's exciting development happening at the moment, you know, for instance, Vishik and other people. And um, um, the, that, that is in, the, in this, in this, uh, in this di general direction. <clears throat> So let's say that we have um, F to be uh, some base field. It, it, don't think of it as being K, K are the coefficients, and G be the absolute general group of, of F. So the... <clears throat> I'm sorry, need some water. G is the, the projective limit of the finite general group of the finite Galois extension of F. Uh, but that's very rarely um, a finite group. It is if the field is the real numbers and, and then in which case you, or a real closed field, in which case you get C2. But beyond that, um, it is something very different. It's a cofinite category. And uh, then what happens is that the, there is a theorem of, of, um, of um, Wojewodski. Well, I mean, it's, it's, the, it's the galois grothendieck correspondence, uh, a bit linearized. Uh, which tells us that this is actually K of G. Uh, I would have to explain what K of G means in this setting, but first let me just think of it as the co-limit of the, the normal open subgroups. Um, so the little O means open of the, of the quotients. Okay, so taking the K of blank is continuous if you want. So this thing here is the limit of the G mod ends, and then uh, you take the co-limit of the corresponding categories. And there's a general result of Martin, which says that the spectrum is continuous in a sense, continuous for um, you know filtered enough uh, gadget like we have here, and so you get from that that the spectrum of um, of this co-limit for any profinite group, um, so it's just the limit of the spectrum of the K of ends. So, and these are finite groups. And so this, you can think, okay, that by the first part, uh, we, we now know. And so you have to compute this limit. And that's a full answer if you want. Um, and the transition map uh, uh, with, with uh, inflation, okay, so the spectrum of inflation being the transition map. And um, it's, a, it's a complete answer, but if you want, it's a, it's a little um, you know, frustrating because you have to describe every point as a limit or so coherent collection of points. And it would be much easier if we could just catch a point by 
the way we did before, that is by telling us, telling, uh, okay, give me a subgroup, something like that, right? Give me a subgroup, give me a prime in the cohomology, and I, I, I want my prime. And that's still true. You can still get as, as corollary all points of the form. Let me write the quotation mark P G H uh, P. So, uh, which are the same same type of construction, modular fixed points, etc. With the only difference that now H is a is a closed P subgroup. Okay, it doesn't have to be a finite. Uh, Piece of, it's unreasonable to hope only for, for uh, finite piece of group. You might hope that you could get away only with the open ones, but you need really an, an intersection there. So the close piece of groups um, and P is, is in in is in the support of the cohomology of the fine group. Okay, so uh, let me see. I have uh, about eight minutes, um, and I would like I wanted to give a picture, but that picture I've already explained in in. Talking all his own uh, maybe a couple of years ago, so let me skip that that, that part uh, and uh, maybe tell you some an interesting, in my opinion, interesting new result of t a new TT result. Okay, so the new uh, TT result that is uh, relevant for um, you know work in progress on simpler descriptions of this of this spectrum, and uh, we can use the those modular fixed points and or restriction to finite subgroups uh, to produce collections of functors out of this category for the profinite groups. So let me abstract the situation. So you have K, a, a rigid TT category, and you have a collection of functors, TT functors from K into some target categories. And, and you assume that they detect nilpotents collectively. Collectively detect uh, tensor nilpotents of maps. So you have a, you have a map in K such that uh, f i of f is tensor nilpotent for every i. Then uh, f is tensor nilpotent. No control on the exponents. You just say something like that. Okay. So um, it was an older result of mine from uh, five years ago that. Uh, I is finite, if you have only finitely many of those functors, that is basically if you have just one, you can, if you're finite, you can get down to one. Uh, it tells you that the map, so let's say we have a, a TT functor from K to L that detects nilpotents. Then the map on spectra is subjective. As you can guess, this is quite useful if you want to describe the spectrum of this gadget that you don't know, you, you construct a functor to something else and, and then um, you work with that. Uh, by the way, there was also interesting development in that direction by uh, Baron Sanders. And um, when you have more than detecting nilpotents, when it's faithful, he can say things about the fibers of this map and also a very exciting uh, new direction going on at the moment. But so you can ask in this setting, so that was just some background. You can ask in this setting, well, what, what can you say about, about uh, here? What can you say about the, 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 the image of, of these, um, this collection of, of gadget to spec in our setting? So if we have a family instead of having just one factor, what, what is the difference? Well, uh, you can show by example, just in the in the profinite case, for instance, with, with the procyclic case, you can show that it won't be subjective. So this is not necessarily subjective. But what you get, the, the theorem is that um, still um, the image is dense. So you might say, okay, well, dense, who cares? Um, because if you, you know, the spectrum, if you think what type of, of spaces this is, these are spectral spaces. So the intuition you can build just by looking at the spectrum of a commutative ring. So if you look at the spectrum of a commutative ring and suppose your ring, uh, you know, for instance, is a domain, is irreducible, um, then the spectrum has a, a single generic point. So uh, the spectrum of a domain would, would have a single generic point or spectrum of you know an irreducible variety has a single generic point, and so like projective space or something like that. And so saying dense, it just says okay, it catches that point, and therefore it's dense. Uh, that's a bit boring. Uh, well, it's also dense for the dual topology. 
So the, those spectral spaces have a, have a dual topology. And being dense on the dual topology basically says something like it catches the close points. That's not, maybe I have to be a little more careful. And again, it's kind of mildly interesting, but um, what, it, what is nice is actually it's dense for the patch topology. Now, I'm telling you it's nice, but you, don't, you might not know what the patch topology is. So it's hard to make. Uh, and it's very bad style to start a definition uh, five minutes before the end of a talk. And you was four minutes before the end of the talk. <laughs> for the patch topology, well, if you know what the patch topology is for um, spectral spaces, then you should have an intuition that this is actually much more uh, dense than, than the, just from the, for the usual topologies. Um, for instance, if I, have, the I, have a, was, I have a question. Yes. You, don't, you don't have any uh, restrictions on your profinite group? No, I haven't told you. This is not profinite business here. This is just an abstract story, right? So I, would, I haven't told you exactly how you want to apply it in the profinite case. And the reason is that there are different applications you may want to do. You may want to do the derived category and restriction to finite subgroups. You may want to do the, okay. um, the same category of permutation modules and the modular fixed points and modular fixed points to some special class of you know, the elementary building subquotients and stuff like that. There's a whole game of that. And as I said, this is kind of work in progress. So I don't want to make it. A, like too much too, too precise commitment and so instead in lieu of that I'm, I'm telling you an abstract general result so k is a general tt category and you have an arbitrary family of, of tt functors and you the only thing you know about it is the text nil potent does it make sense yeah thank and you I want, yeah and i want to say that the what happens is that in that case the image is dense for the patch topology and i was trying to give you an intuition of what the patch topology is and as I said, if the spectrum is finite, this actually means subjective. There is no, in the finite case, it would mean uh, dense for the patch topology means everything. So it's not just the closed stuff and the, the open stuff, it's everything. Hmm? But if, if the spectrum is infinite, well, you can miss some point, but let me give you a, um, a formulation that should help you uh, get some feelings. So if you have a subset of um, it's a general uh, property, hmm? this thing, so the patch topology is the one generated by the, the um, constructible uh, pieces, so the intersection of a quasi-compact open and the complement of quasi-compact open. And so, and you take a topology generated by that. It's a Hausdorff topology, which is very rare for those uh, uh, spectra, right? It's a, the spectra are typically not Hausdorff, as you see here, where the points have generated, can be generated. So the patch topology is, is a compact Hausdorff. But what does it mean that if you have a subset of the of the spectrum, what does it mean to be, uh, to be patch dense? So, you see, what was the key um, interesting property of the spectrum? The key interesting property is that the support of objects um, detect, in fact, you could also say for inclusion, um, detect when the, the objects generate the same idea, right? The support of objects tell you everything about the TT classification of objects, right? The, the, the weakening of the naive classification where you ask things to be isomorphic, you is weakening by saying, can I build one object from another? Mm -hmm. And so if you have a subset, you can also define a, a support restricted to X. You just say, okay, I'm just using the support of A and I intersect it with X. I only remember the part of, of the support of an object which lives in X. And then X uh, is patch dense. So as I, as I said, the definition is it's dense for the patch topology, but if you don't like that, you could say if and only if uh, this thing is still true, this thing is still true, but with this, um, with this um, um, restricted support. And you could also say it, um, if you prefer, you could also say it um, with inclusions. So in other words, it's saying, well, um, I've only kept a part of the, the spectrum, which is, um, you know, the raison d'etre of the spectrum is the classification of objects and TT ideas and whatnot. And, but sometimes you can get away with only a piece of the information to get to, to recover that part of the classification, the classification of objects. Mm -hmm. And um, when, it's, when it's patch dense, um, if, if and only if, it's patch dense if and only if there is enough information to do the reconstruction of objects. And, and the corollary of that is actually you can recover, can reconstruct um, the whole of spec K. 
not only from X, but from X and this data of the, of the slope. Okay. Kind of compression uh, operation. So these are the type of, of gadgets which uh, would fall under the new direction thing. So this, this is, I, 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 I dropped my chalk at this point. You, haven't, you don't see it, but I, I put my, down my pen. <laughs> so, um, the, but I just, let me just say that these are kind of new type of results that um, could be interesting, um, not only for, you know, the permutation category, but for general profinite group type of questions on, on spectra. And uh, um, I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Paul. Can we all unmute ourselves and give the speaker a very generous round of applause? Any see. questions? Yeah, if you have any questions, you can unmute yourself and ask, or you can put them in the chat. Um, sorry, I have a question. Hey, yeah. Paul. I don't. So, um, so does a theory of like homological primes come into into play here at all? I mean, you have this. You have the. Yes, uh, so they, they don't um, necessarily come into play, but uh, they are controlled. Uh, so there is also a continuity of, of the homological um, spectrum. So uh, that was um, proven recently by um, uh, Balchin and um, Bartel um, yeah. and Barnes, maybe. Let's, let's hit one more B. <laughs> okay. um, so um, they are. I'm not sure. I'm not sure it's a um, preprint is out or not yet. No, I don't think so. So, but they they, they mentioned that uh, last week, uh, two weeks ago, in a conference. So, um, and in particular, if you know that the um, that the two are the same, that the homological spectrum and the usual spectrum are the same at all finite stages, then you will know it also for the finite groups. So, it, it, the comparison map, the the nervous steel conjecture survives also that. <laughs> So um, and and um, yes, when you when you think of you know detection of nil potents, it's it's very much in that flavor, mm -hmm. except that here we play only with the compact objects. So detection of nil potents uh, mm -hmm. is subjectivity on the homological spectrum. If you use maps from a compact object to an arbitrary object, mm -hmm. and that's essentially the nil potents theorem. It's a, it's a variation on that theme. So that's not hard, but here we are just playing with with. With compact objects and and, um, and so and you get only a density and indeed in examples as I said you're not going to get um, subjectivity so you should not hope for a strong there's no stronger statement it also says that these functors that we would play with in, in, in for profinite groups they would not detect the importance of map from a compact to an arbitrary object because otherwise as you point mm -hmm. out they would that would have them. A statement in the homological spectrum, and because they agree, it would give us subjectivity. Right. Thank you. Thank you. There's a question from Pablo in the chat. Uh, Pablo, can you read it? I can't read the diagram part of the question. So <laughs> let me see if I can see the chat. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah, like I remember, like the the spectrum permutation modules was like a bunch of like V's like this, and I think right. Martin at some uh, Martin at some point said that they like went up to infinity, and I can never remember if they ended or not. Uh, are all spectrums discrete for permutation modules? No, not at all. I mean, you've, you've seen this picture uh, with the, the curves, right? In small dimension, uh, in, in small P rank, you can build a, a wrong intuition. You know, we, you start, we, we really started with C2 because we said, okay, one Galois group, and when is it finite? Well, C2 would be good. So we, we handled C2. C2 is just three points. It's a finite spectrum. But... Um, um, I don't think, I mean, let me try to not make a silly statement, but um, yeah, for cyclic groups, you still get a, a finite W like that. And, um, but um, as soon as you go into, you know, the, the, the measure is the sectional P rank. But for instance, of course, if you get to P rank, um, bigger than two, you have the cohomological open as a piece. So everything you knew from the derived category still applies here. So if the, the usual spectrum, the usual cohomological support variety is infinite, then of course 
this one is also infinite because you, you get it as a piece. But also, even when this, the, I'm using cases like, you know, quaternion eight, where the, the, the spectrum, the cohomological open is just two points, the, because the cohomology has a single generator. I mean, <laughs> for the center, you have a single generator. So for, for the, the maximal elementary abelian subgroup, you just get two points. But if you mod out by the center, you get a quaternion, quaternion force, uh, uh, Klein force, so you get a, uh, C2 cross C2. And so in that case, you get a whole P1 in, in, the, in the support of DSK, which is an infinite uh, set, uh, not discrete. I mean, I, mean, even, I mean, even for CP, they're not technically discrete at three points, but there are specialization relations, right? The generic. So, but maybe, I, I understood discrete by saying finite, maybe that's what you had in mind. Discrete them essentially never are except for G trivial. But finite is also an accident. And at the beginning, we thought, okay, maybe what happens is that you look at the derived category and there will be some decoration, right? There will be some stuff on the acyclic, but it will just be, you know, repeat a little bit of the derived category or something. It won't be too complicated. And then, then we realize as the P rank grows and the section of P rank grows that. The, the support of the AC click can really explode compared to the, the usual cohomological open. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Julie. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, oh, sorry. Uh, thanks. <laughs> no, it's fine. <laughs> thanks for your talk. Um, I wanted to ask something um, about the beginning um, when you talked about the spectrum. What if you um, enlarge the homomorphism sets? Like, for example, I work with. Artin Milner Witt motifs. So I want to put bilinear forms basically on my morphism sets. Would you expect the spectrum to be bigger? Yeah, that's an important point of this uh, whole game. So uh, in two seconds, let me tell you the, the story that I think either Martin or I have, have said in some of the talks. So um, instead of the reduction to elementary abelian that happens for the Cohomological open, you have a reduction to elementary region sub quotients. Instead of subgroups, you have to play with sub quotients. And so you can reduce the question of understanding that for elementary region groups. In the case of elementary region groups, uh, you can introduce a, a twisted cohomology, which is not just the homes from uh, one to its shifts, from the unit to its shifts, but you have uh, shifts and twists, like you would expect, you know with um, the motivic setting. And, but you have lots, lots, and lots of twists to put in. Actually, in the elementary abelian case, you have, you have to introduce invertibles, as many invertibles as you have index P subgroups. Yeah. And so you get a, a big multi-graded ring there. And you look at the spectrum of this multi-graded ring, but you still have a comparison now between the triangular spectrum and the spectrum of this multi-graded ring, the usual construction. You just take a prime and look at the maps whose cone is not in the prime. That gives you a homological prime. And this map is injective. So in other words, um, the, if you follow the pattern of you know, um, reduction to elementary region, use cohomology, it doesn't work. But if you understand reduction to elementary region in the sense of with modular fixed points, so elementary region sub quotients, not just subgroups. OK. And then you understand reduced to cohomology by reduced to cohomology with lots of twists, multi-graded ring, then it works. It, and it works in a slightly tricky way that the, the image of the spectrum is not the whole cohomology. You have to identify what is the open. And you, we do that with some explicit equations and stuff. So that's, that's, um, yeah, that's another part of the story I could tell. Yeah. Oh, it's, again, it's all in the, in the preprint. If you want to read it, it's out there. But um, that's, that's one of them. So one of the tricks. Thank you Thank for you. the question. Any other questions? Uh, Pablo? Yeah, maybe uh, concerning the name, the like causal objects were used by, like, I can remember exactly the authors, like I think Berg, Iyengar, Krauss, and Opperman, I think. Like they used the action of some grid algebra. Is there a relation between the two? Have you ever answered no to the question, is there a relation? <laughs> <laughs> Very dangerous statement to say there's no relation at all. I mean, I, I can be more specific, right? No, like I, you, I, I, I don't your unit, I, the endomorphism of unit is some graded algebra, you have an action. Is that like, 
are those right. the same? So, like the causal objects in their context and your causal objects are the, the yeah. I don't I don't know coincide? the context, but it's it's a very standard causal construction, right? You're tensoring together um, length one, I mean, just the cone of a single map. That's the causal construction. And then uh, here you have to remember how the group acts. So it's a bit tricky. It's an equivalent type of construction. It's it's a norm if you want to think that way. It's a tensor induction, right? So. Uh, it certainly relates to lots of other things that have been done, but um, yeah, you still have to do it. I mean, you still have to, you still have to do it in this case. Right? No, I can be more specific. Yeah, so like they they have like a, a graded algebra acting on the triangulated category, and then they they call causal objects the one that fail at the very end of an exact sequence. Anyway. Yeah. Okay, any other questions or comments? Well, if there are no more comments or questions, uh, let's thank Paul again. Thank you. Thank you again for waking up so early for the talk. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank yeah. you.